Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this, our eighth annual Tribute to the Fallen with the Gold Star Parents from California. And we're just blessed to have you here. And as I said to several of you last night, it's this event that defines us here at the Marines Memorial. Every one of the members of this team that puts on this event, they look forward to the Gold Star Parents experience because it's some way, in some way, we all feel like we're doing something to help. And we count our blessings every day and the Shays are part of our blessings. And you know, today I introduced and read the name of Tim Shea, Ranger. He, by the way, is mentioned in uh, General McChrystal's book. Uh, your special folks, Shays. Bill Shea, do our table grace, please. To be introduced by General Myatt is one of the great privile pri privileges and pleasures. Dear God, courage, dedication, and sacrifice are qualities that we rightly and readily associate with those who comprise our beloved fallen. Now here we are, far from the danger of battle, in a safe haven. And yet we find that these very same qualities permeate the Marines Memorial Association, General Myatt and his dedicated staff, and the Blue Star Moms. They've recognized our need for affirmation and consolation, and they have the courage to do something about it. The dedication with which they perform is shown in every detail that encompasses this event. The sacrifice of their time and effort is measured in the tears they share, the embraces they provide, the encouragement they offer. This is our blessing. This is the blessing that connects all gathered here. This is the blessing that makes possible the bonding with our beloved fallen. This is the blessing that enables us to live and move forward in a reality that is mysterious and wonderful. Mysterious because despite our efforts to grasp it, our loss defies description. Wonderful because in the face of our loss, we have found a time and a place and the people who appreciate and understand the courage, the dedication, and the sacrifice of the ones who cannot be replaced, but who can be remembered with pride and dignity and compassion. Yes, we are scarred, but if we pay close attention, we discover another quality greatly wished for each of us by our beloved fallen, resilience. Imagine your loved one and realize that there is a time and a place to celebrate and remember with poignant delight the blessing that each of our beloved fallen has been to each of us and will continue to be. Your beloved fallen longs for you to be resilient. The Marines Memorial Association, General Myatt and his dedicated staff, the Blue Star Moms, and all of us are the people with whom to be resilient, with whom to laugh and cry and celebrate. We are blessed and ever so grateful. Bless all of us here and may our gratitude be a beacon of truth and encouragement to all that we encounter hereafter. Amen. You know, in the Marine Corps, well, all services, we're uh, military, you really get two workers for one salary. <laughs> and, and the wives are really key, and Helen's been a leader in taking care of Marine families. 
And I'll highlight one in particular. She's been a big part of something called the Semper Fi Fund, which is a fund to help the wounded and the wounded families come out of Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. And it's been such an important role. And it's, an, it's a nonprofit that we're all particularly proud of. It's the on, only two veteran nonprofits are rated A plus in the Charity Watch. One is the Fisher House, the other is the Semper Fi Fund, and it's because of people like Helen Peter. But the, the reason it's so important to have somebody like Lieutenant General Tulin here is that he's here and both of them wanted to come up and be with these Gold Star parents because under his command, he's lost Marines. And I will tell you that for a commander who has a Marine killed or a soldier killed executing his orders, when that individual dies, a little bit of that commander dies too. And he understands his own feelings and he empathizes very much with you. And he's gonna to talk tonight about, some of it's gonna be about what he's been doing or what he did in Afghanistan, but more importantly, He's going to pay tribute to the fallen. So if I could have Lieutenant General, help me welcome Lieutenant General John Taylor. I got lemonade instead of water. I thought I was getting water, and I got lemonade. So if you see a sour puss on my face, you know it's from that. <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I do really seriously want to uh, tell everybody here that I I have, in the past 36 hours, met a lot of you, heard a lot of stories, and, uh, oh, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> he didn't want me to sell the bad lemonade in the place. <laughs> and that uh, by hearing the stories and, and, and relating to many of the families, uh, I learned an awful lot. And I think in that itself, it was worth the effort to, to come up here and, and uh, address the, the Gold Star families. I'm very impressed by the uh, Blue Star Moms and their association. And and, and the incredible compassion that they've, they've demonstrated uh, since I've been here, but I know now for almost eight, nine years, I guess eight years now. So. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the, you know, the Marine Memorial staff is just uh, phenomenal. Uh, I, I challenge their uh, multimedia uh, techniques, and I think they're going to come through with flying colors today. Because I know I didn't want to board. Because I know I didn't want to bore you, because I, 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 my speech is really about two hours. <laughs> and with the video and the audio, it may be two and a half. I am somewhat uh, intimidated by the fact that the speaker last year was a close friend of mine and Helen's, uh, General John Kelly and his wife Karen. And uh, for those of you that were here last year, you know that uh, it was an extraordinarily moving uh, moment when uh, John gave his wife a blue st a gold star. Um, and so, but John, Kelly, I guess I can't call him John because he's a four-star now. So General Kelly, uh, you know, he's a, good, he's a good Irishman. And like myself, I'm a pretty good Irishman as well. I thought I'd open up by telling you just a quick story about an Irishman named Patty. Now, Patty uh, had just recently moved into uh, County Kerry in, in Ireland. And uh, he'd walked into the pub there, and like most good Irishmen would do, and he said, please give me three beers. And so the bartender looked at him a little strange, but lined up three beers. And he sat there and he drank them in that conversation. And then he ordered three more. The bartender thought that was very odd. He said, he said to me, he says, excuse me, sir. He says, why, why are you ordering three beers? He says, yeah, it does seem odd, doesn't it? He says, well, let me tell you. He says, my brother Sean, he went to America many years ago. And uh, my brother Seamus, he went to Australia. And so we had made a decision that whenever we went to a bar, we would drink 
and with each other, and we would order three beers. And the bartender said, well, that's very strong. I can see you have a very strong family. That's wonderful. And before you know it, the people in the county were like saying, the man who drinks three beers, what a wonderful thing. What a beautiful family. And so the people would come from far and wide to see the man who drinks three beers and watch him drink. So eventually one day he came, comes into the pub and he, and he orders two. And the bartender was taken back. He says, oh, he says, there must be something wrong. So he finally he approaches him. He says, Patty, he says, I'm sorry, did, did you lose your brother? He says, with two beers and all. And Patty thought for a minute and he says, hmm. He says, oh, you'd be happy to know that Seamus is fine. What was the other name I used, Sean? <laughs> I think it was Sean. And Sean is fine, he says, but I decided that since it was Lent and all, I'd give up drinking for, beer, for Lent. <laughs> so you know, family is important, and this is what it's all about here is family. I want to tell you that uh, General Kelly didn't speak about his son, Robert, who uh, last time at last year's event. Um, but I want to tell you a little something about him because I, I knew Robert. And uh, Robert uh, was 17 and he had decided that he was going to take a year off from college and he was going to go to Mons, Belgium at Shape headquarters where I was, sta I was stationed and where General Kelly had been brought out uh, to uh, work there at the headquarters. And he decided to take the year off with his family and enjoy Europe. I mean, it was, it was a, great, a great thought that only comes from a young man who kind of knows what he wants. And so during that year, it was really an incredible year, he traveled all over Europe. Uh, he made tremendous friends. He was part of a theater group that my kids, who were close friends with the Kelly kids, were involved in. And it was unbelievable. I mean, they had ran a theatrical group that had the whole community in hysterics several times, uh, doing several plays. He's just a very talented young man. Uh, we also uh, had decided, uh, General Kelly and myself, to take our sons to the battlefield at the Somme uh, and to, to spend some time there studying that. And I can tell you that I know it had an impact on my son, and I know it impacted on Robert as well. Just the, the devastation that war does bring. And, and for those of you who have seen the battlefields in Europe, you know it really brings you up close and personal when you see the trench warfare that went on during World War I. So it was sort of an epic day. Well, I left Belgium, and the next time I saw Robert, he was graduating from the uh, University of Florida. And, or excuse me, Florida State University. <laughs> Gotta get that right, right? <laughs> and uh, he then enlisted in the Marine Corps. And I, you know, I asked him, I said, Robert, I said, why, why are you enlisted in the Marine Corps? And he said, well, you know, that's the way my father did it. He enlisted and then he, did, he, he then moved up into uh, get a commission. And I said, wow, that's, that's tremendous. I mean, just the fact that, you know, the father and his image and his impact on his son, and he made that call. Well, Robert went off to Fallujah in 2004, and he was in the second fight for Fallujah. He was a rocket man. He was on a rocket team. And there's a great picture of him, actually, in the Marine Corps Museum. You see Robert down on one knee. He's got the ACOG in his eyeball, and he's got, his, his, he's got the, the, the gunner for the rockets just launched the missiles into a building. It's a pretty powerful uh, image of the, the conflict in Fallujah at that time. He, uh, Robert then took a commission and uh, he became a member of 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. And he went back, he went to Afghanistan in, in uh, 2010 and on 9 November he was killed. And he was killed by an IED. Um, you know, really a fine young man, just like the young men that I've seen portrayed today at the memorial ceremony. And 
that's how I look and I regard the quality of the people that are serving our country today. It's tremendous. It's like Robert Kelly's. It's amazing. When his dad gave the uh, memorial comments in front of everybody, one of the things he said which stuck with me was the fact that he wanted to apologize to many of the Gold Star families who he, like I and many other commanders, have had contact with. And that's never really easy, but, and he would tell, tell the families, he'd say, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, and I understand how you feel. Because at that moment, at the memorial of his own son, he said, you know, I apologize. Because I don't understand, I didn't understand how you feel. And I didn't understand until I lost Robert, and now I realize it's unfathomable. And that was the word he used. Losing a child is unfathomable. Now, Helen and I have, uh, we've uh, shared many worries about our kids. Some of you know I got a son that did a couple of tours in Afghanistan, a couple, and two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. I got a daughter that's in Afghanistan right now in Kabul. And so, you know, you share those worries. Um, you remember walking him across the street and saying, hey, hold my hand. Where are you going? And now all of a sudden, he's walking the streets by himself in places like Sangin and Helmand Province and other places. But those worries are not a loss. And it's hard to understand. As a Marine leader, and as General Myatt just said earlier, you know, it's, it's tough to realize that some of the decisions that you make lead to the loss of a life and creation of a hero. Um, I, I think that uh, it's one of those great ironies of being a commander is those that you love the most, in order to save them, must put them in harm's way. Because you can't sit idly by. There's action that needs to be taken. There's a natural bias for action. Inaction is never going to work. My wife, Helen, as was mentioned earlier, is a key partner in, in my whole relationship as a commander. And even though we did memorials in theater for our guys that we lost, the fact was is the real difficulties were when my wife faced the families at home at those memorials. It's a special relationship. But who better than a Blue Star mother to understand a grieving family? Because those worries do sort of bring it together, bring it home. But the challenge for us really is to make sure that all their effort, all their work means something. That the sacrifice was worth it. I, I, I think that one of the greatest fears among the families of Gold Star families is that you worry, is that sacrifice worth it? I want to show you a short film clip that I put together right, before, right after I left Afghanistan that shows you what we were doing and why I think those sacrifices that were made will pay huge dividends for our nation's security for years to come. Afghanistan was uh, deeply involved with the um, uh, war, with a war which is they, uh, every household they lost their dears. And uh, in every household they lost one or two uh, of uh, part of their family, a member of their families. And uh, they all got hurt badly. And, uh, and this, you know, this place was actually war zone. And this province uh, 
provincial province was one of the war zones. When we first came here, our mission was to take the Taliban and reduce the, the impact of the insurgency against the government of Afghanistan. Uh, we've taken the fight for the Taliban, and the Taliban no longer can really engage the coalition forces here in Helmand province. The Taliban commander has been killed, and the rest of the Taliban have moved out to Yasim Shah. When we first pushed into Marja back in uh, February 2010, there, it was almost like a ghost town, for lack of better words. When we showed up, we told the people we were coming, there was, there was no one there. The, uh, the bazaars were completely empty, no one was around. After a few weeks, the people started recognizing that the Marines were there. They would come out, they would greet us, they started opening themselves up, and uh, eventually they started flooding in, performing their jobs within the bazaar. Almost a year later, almost to the date, it was actually a year and two months, I returned to Marja. This time, I found that the bazaars were completely packed full of people, almost like a city back in the States. The greatest improvement I saw was there were solar panels lighting the entire bazaar. When we moved in there, it, it was, like I said, a ghost town. There was nothing. And then all of a sudden there's paved roads and solar panels to at night they can safely walk around with lights all down the main bazaar, which is, that, that was pretty amazing. As you see right now today here, like more than like thousand people are setting wooden reinforces and resolving their problems with the government. This place has used to be the hub and the center for for the terrorist or the drug narcotic center, Marja. But as of right now, today you don't even see the signs of or effects of them here in Marja. You you all are setting your people free here. Indeed, sir. We are together. Yes, we are team. together. You helping we us? We helping you. Thank you. First time when we pushed up uh, just north of here for uh, the PB, and uh, it was just completely empty. Nobody here at all. Not a soul around. And two weeks later, you pretty much got all this. Yep. Everything you see. Uh, I think the best way actually is to go down Highway 1, one and see how the, uh, the trade, the commercial trade has, has developed. It's really fantastic. So I think we have seen uh, during the last uh, year or so and, and also during our tour an, a decrease in uh, kinetic activities. Uh, it's going better and better on the, uh, the commercial uh, side. And we see a more and more capable and more popular uh, governance within the, within the city. Now. The mission is changing somewhat. The mission is changing from what was our responsibility as coalition forces to engage the Taliban to now ensuring that we're backing up the Afghan security forces, the Afghan National Army and the police, civil order police, border patrol, national directorate of services, etc. And so now we're in that advisor trainer mode. Been a rather significant shift for us in the sense that the ANA and the Afghan National Police have really matured greatly over the course of the past year. They're now, and we're seeing it happen, where they're now starting to take the lead for many of the operations uh, that a year ago we would have been taking the lead for. And that's happening both on the Army and the police side. So that's a bit of a cataclysmic change for us, and it's a sign of progress towards where we're headed. As you know, the Taliban have had a large presence in Helmand for the past eight years. I'm happy with the results that the Academy and the Marines are showing. I'm happy we have soldiers in different areas of Helmand who are trained by Marines. 215 Corps is the newest corps in the field. It's been built on operations. It's learnt its skills alongside the British Army and the US Marine Corps, and it's now more than a match for the insurgents. Today's Afghan soldiers are learning the engineering skills, artillery skills, intelligence, medical and clerical skills that are going to sustain it into the future. We're teaching the Afghans to teach themselves and they're already proving capable counterinsurgents. They're a welcome stop against the injustice and cruelty of the insurgents. They are the future. The ability for what uh, 
uh, General Nicholson and then General Mills and now General Tulin to have established those relationships with each of their Afghan counterparts. And, and that gives the Afghans a sense of um, uh, strength knowing that that transition from one leader to another will endure. And that relationship that we've had with the Afghans has never wavered. But in addition, we're still continuing with our efforts in governance and development. So for example, as many know, we went up to Kajiki just a couple of months ago. Why did we go up there? Because Kajiki stands not only as a symbol of Jeroa primacy, but it also is a symbol of American ingenuity and development. I mean, those, that uh, dam goes back 60 years when the United States came in under USAID and did tremendous work and transformed Helmand Province into an agricultural belt. Uh, in really bringing agribusiness uh, to the forefront within Helmand Province, making uh, farming and farmers more uh, business farmers than just subsistence farmers. Just to give you an example of some of the things that we've been able to do s since 2009, since the coalition forces and the U.S. surge began, I've told our Marines as they leave Helmand Province and they go home after a rotation, that not only have they contributed to the security and not only have they contributed to the advisor training role for the Afghans, but they've also transformed Helmand Province in other ways. For example, from a commercial perspective, we've built over 1,072 kilometers of roads. Those roads are going to tie together all the major districts in Helmand Province and allow the farmers to bring their produce to market. Instead of just subsistence and and living off of it, they're now able to actually move that stuff around and sell it and make some money. We found uh, that whenever we make a, a gravel road, a simple gravel road, whether it be of 611 or of what we call Route Red, I guess you can say freedom of movement, the first word freedom is really what, really what we're providing. It gives them the freedom to choose what they're doing, gives them the freedom to choose the Jeroa versus uh, the Taliban, and it's all based on a road. As we get more connected to Lashkarga, this will help governance uh, so that the uh, provincial government can come up and uh, actually do the things that are necessary to connect the people to their own government. There has to be some alternatives to the growth of poppy. Poppy is something that is easy to grow, it requires very little maintenance, and it provides a lot of money. But that money doesn't go to the farm, it doesn't go to the legitimate people, it goes to the the land mafia, those that are more concerned about making money than they are about taking care of families. But Camps Narcotics has also been a big, a big effort and that's really been led by Governor Mangle and he's made that a very strong theme to drive down the narcotics trade. So for a lot of time that was about giving out subsidised wheat seed so farmers could grow wheat instead of poppy. And what we've seen in the last three years is a 40% reduction in poppy cultivation in Helmand. So in the last 12 months, really for the first time, we've tried to broaden that program to get into more high value crops, alfalfa, winter vegetables, things like that. And I think we see that as the way forward. So these roads offer an alternative for the farmers to grow something else and make a profit. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But with the help of other nations, with the donations of other nations, with the technical know-how that's brought in through NGOs and IOs, we'll make a difference. But it's going to take time. We've also made an investment in the future of Afghanistan. Today there's 133 schools. Today we've got over 1,600 teachers. I mean, that's a difference. And those teachers are coming here because they know that they can come down here and they can teach properly and they don't have to worry about the rest of their life. Almost uh, 17 to 18 schools we have here, which are all active. It has teachers, students. The teachers uh, on time are coming to their schools, and the students uh, are attending their schools. Almost, as I mentioned before, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, uh, compared to the past, the education has been improved here. So the mission continues to change and it continues to evolve, but we're putting more and more of the effort, more and more of the focus onto the Afghans, and we're stepping back and we're supporting them. It's about 80 
perhaps even 85% less violent than it was during these months last year. And that is tremendous progress. Perhaps the trump card in all of that is an ever increasingly willful population in Nad Ali who are increasingly defining their vote against the insurgency and in favour of Afghan legitimacy. And we see hard evidence of that almost every day. We uh, sweep out all the areas, leading the uh, ANA up to the rooms and allowing the ANA to actually push into the rooms uh, so the locals can see that the ANA are uh, up front and also doing all the searching so that we're eventually going to just turn it over and uh, the locals will have trust in the ANA. It's very important for us to understand why we are here and what's the purpose. And we will accomplish our mission and we'll stay here as long as it takes. The threats are not completely gone and the security has got to stay strong and we've got to make sure the Afghan national security forces are resourced properly. That's a very important thing. But as long as they're resourced properly, the security will be maintained. The biggest threat that we have to the security forces is corruption. And as I said earlier, if we can offer alternative livelihoods to the Afghans, we'll, get, we'll cut through that corruption. And if we maintain the security like we have right now, we'll have a rule of law. We'll have prosecutors, attorneys, and judges that are willing to come down here into, into Helmand province and establish rule of law. And so people that do turn towards corruption will be held accountable. Because we trust each other, we are working together, uh, we have confidence in each other. That's why we brought this peace. And that is the key, it is trust. Trust builds everything. The point is that we've made a difference. We've taken Helmand province from a very kinetic environment, a place where we've had significant fights, significant violence, significant battles against the Taliban. So today, where the number of kinetic activities is diminished, yet the activity and the improvement in governance and development is just skyrocketed. So the difference is very evident. As you can see, the uh, British guys uh, speak a lot better than I do. That <laughs> was, was the hardest part. It was not learning, learning Pashto, it was learning British. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the film gave you a perspective, and I can certainly provide copies of it. There's only a couple more minutes left in it, but it gives you a perspective of what your sons and daughters and what they've been doing in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, the thing is, is that the deeds that have been accomplished in places like Iraq and Afghanistan are, are remembered by the people. They remember it. It's amazing the, how much the uh, Afghanis remember the U.S. in the early 50s and 60s when we came out there with USAID and built those dams. They remember. And it makes a difference. And there are people in Iraq and Afghanistan who, because they've seen the sacrifice given by our, by our men and our women, they're not going to give up. They're going to stick it through. It's tough, but they will. And many of those Afghan security forces are now taking far more casualties than we were. But they're still going to fight. Talking about those deeds is a lot like this weekend or these past couple of days and talking about our sons, daughters, your sons, your daughters, and what they do. For me, it's therapy to tell stories about a couple of, a couple of guys that I know. And I, and I want to relate a couple to you this evening. 
In Iraq, in Iraq back in uh, 2003, I had an EOD technician who was a young sergeant. He was tremendous. And uh, he made friends with the Iraqis throughout the route that we took going up into Baghdad. He would actually go around and travel homes and where there was unexploded ordnance, he would clear it for the locals because, you know, parents were concerned that this unexploded ordnance might affect their children and the way they're, you know, they're back and forth to school or whatever. And this guy would go out and every day he would clear unexploded ordnance. The following year, uh, he was with me in 2004, where we, again, it's a different scenario, a lot of uh, the potential for IEDs all over the place. And as the EOD uh, chief at the time, now a staff sergeant, he, uh, he had a lot of work to do. And one day, uh, we had a little firefight in a place called Karma. Uh, some of the Marines like to call it bad karma. But uh, we were in there, and I heard, I heard that uh, one of my, my guys uh, in the outpost at a school in Karma, a rockets had been fired at him off of the top of a car. So I headed towards Karma from where I was, and I got there, and it was amazing. This car had somehow they had fashioned rockets on top of the car. The guys, the, 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 uh, the Iraqi insurgent was able to get a rocket off and hit the school building. No real casualties at the time, but just amazing to think, you know, the, the extent to which some of these insurgents would go to put rockets on top of a car and just fire them willy-nilly. So I went over to observe, and some of the rockets were on the ground, and so it was considered unexploded ordnance. So I scoped it out. We put standard, I, you know, we isolated the objective area, sort of, uh, as, as we were supposed to do. And um, I looked at this car. I looked at the rockets. Then I went over to the school building to see how the guys were doing in, in their position. And as I entered the building, I heard a large blast. And when I looked out, the car with the rockets exploded. And there was an IED in the back, of the, in the trunk of the car. And the real technique was for the insurgent to bring attention to this very weird contraption and bring EOD technicians in close enough to the unexpended ordinance on the ground and then blow up the vehicle, which killed Staff Sergeant Clark. And I know that it's very close and personal to me because not only did I spend a lot of time with him, and I tell his story often, but the fact is, is that, you know, it could have easily have been myself. And, you know, there's a certain little guilt that you have when you come back from a situation like that and go, you know, why wasn't that me? But Gundy Clark, a true hero. We got to make sure that our entire nation as a whole does not forget those sacrifices made by this generation of warriors and their families. You know, we can look back at history and we can see where we failed our guys to some extent. But like you, I'm sure that on public holidays like Memorial Day and Veterans Day, you make a special point of not only remembering those stories and remembering your family members, but also educating everybody around you as to exactly what is Memorial Day and Veterans Day all about. I tried to do that with my children at an early age. Make sure they understood that this freedom that they have is not free. I think Abraham Lincoln is a clear example of an American leader who understood that a nation which fails to honor those who defend it with their lives will likely cease to be a free nation. Lincoln spoke for less than two minutes in Gettysburg. But his passionate words resonated as much today for our nation and your sons and daughters as they did 150 years ago. The fight for the United States was a fight to determine if any nation conceived in liberty can so endure. America remains a great experiment, but can any nation endure under free will? 
Ronald Reagan led this nation through communism, over to succeed over communism. Communism. But ask some of those people who live on the other side of the, the gates. Ask them if they think life is any better. You'd be amazed. They say no. They say that it was better, that democracy is chaos, that freedom is chaos. We liked making sure that we knew where we were going to get our bread and our money from. It's interesting. But until one tastes real freedom, and it's not real freedom in places that were former communist countries yet, many would remain in that socialist and communist or terrorist network. Of course, in this country, we have those who feel entitled to this freedom. We here tonight know it's not free. In order for this great experiment to survive, sacrifice is required. Today, the task is taken up by only 1% of America. And there are men and women who believe in this country enough to put their lives on the line without qualification and without thought of personal gain. Proud to serve a cause higher than themselves, regardless of the outcome, they gave meaning to two questions. Two questions that Robert Kelly asked his parents. If not me, Dad, who? And if not now, Mom, when? President Reagan stated, we are at war with a dangerous enemy that is the that most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind. And it's been said that if we lose that war, and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. I want you to listen to what President, how President Reagan finished that statement. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. The answer is duty. There is a point beyond which America should tolerate. And that's when we stand our duty. Your sons, your daughters stood their duty. And we should be very thankful and proud of that. It's interesting, the martyrs of history, those we honor today fulfilled that duty. As Reagan said in his words at Gettysburg, I mean, as Lincoln said in his words in Gettysburg, summed it up pretty well. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add. The world will little note, no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us here to be dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. And that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you, thank you. You know, I do believe that the parents of the Marines and sailors and soldiers who 
were and are now under the command of General Tulin feel blessed because they know that their sons and daughters are led by a wonderful, wonderful person. So I would thank you so much. Now we do have some of those Marines that are led by General Tulin that are here tonight and they're going to add some levity to this tonight. And they happen to be the music that the Marines enjoy every day down at Camp Pendleton and they're from, the 1st Marine Division is part of his command at the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force and we have members of the 1st Marine Division Band who are going to come in here and entertain us.